book is really a, yeah, for a large part, it's a diary of the last 10 years of my research, where I entered into a new field. My background is in computer science and psychology, studying music. And in the last 10 years, I tried to make the bridge to biology because I was, and I still are interested in the possible biological basis of musicality, of our capacity. The future of music. How is music and innovation going to work together? Yeah, the book is not like like this is how it shows. This is what we know, but we know so very little. <laughs> the main point of the book is to show the process of how to answer questions like when is, a, is, when is an animal musical and it is sort of uh, showing all my visits to all these different labs where I sort of entered a new, new fields of especially behavioral biology and uh, neurobiology disciplines that have their all, all own toolkit and a long tradition of, of, um, of doing research and then the, the, yeah, the challenge was to sort of yeah, to try to understand those methods that were relevant for my question and convince those researchers of the rele relevance of my question and that they got enthusiastic as well and that they wanted to collaborate. So I describe at least four long-term collaborations that I have with behavioral and neurobiologists. Just by meeting them and, and talking and getting enthusiastic and in the end also contributing to their literature. That's nice about interdisciplinary research. If you find a question, two disciplines or even more disciplines find fascinating, then you have a true interdisciplinary research because then yeah, people are motivated and they, if they want to know, uh, a scientist is happy. But the outcome of the research of a neurobiologist, the measures are so different to somebody who's doing research in, say, a behaviorist biology. How can that be compared or can it just be um, like a spectrum of answers? Yeah, sometimes another's perspective is really adding another level or another layer, so they're not necessarily connected, but they're projected on top of each other, to use that metaphor. But in, in my research at the tribe here, I really try to meet in the sense that the things that you measure or observe uh, are interpretable at both ends. So, for instance, for, for, for beat perception or, or tactile feel, Music theory has a very clear way of saying which is a syncopation and which is what is not a syncopation as a note. So there's a whole theory and even some mathematics on saying, well, this note is more syncopated than that note. And then from neurobiology, you have methods that can say, well, that note is, is, is unexpected or not. So that's a slightly different measure, but you can relate that to an expected note in music. And if you then can sort of link those two methods, you suddenly have a very powerful interpretation of a theory for music that predicts this note is highly expected and this one is not highly expected. And from neurobiology that says something about the auditory system and the way that it shapes uh, expectations. And an index of that, the mismatch negativity in the, in the neurobiological sense, uh, uh, predicting or showing yes or no whether that is a reality in the brain. And that's what we could match. We could match uh, in newborns that they really have high expectation for the downbeat of the rhythm and not somewhere else in the rhythm. Showing a big peak, neurobiological peak in the signal if it is removed on the downbeat and not somewhere else in the rhythm. Exactly in the way classical music theory, theory predicts. <laughs> so you have a, a very long tradition of humanity research in musicology that predicts the structure of meter and how syncopation works with a very uh, biologically founded method that says something about how the brain works and uh, makes expectations. So there the two worlds really nicely meet and that's, that's not always happening because yeah, as I said before, sometimes you have, it is more like a layers of knowledge. This book in a way is also a layer of knowledge because I, I behave like an anthropologist. At some point I remove myself from the scene or I film it just to see what, what are we doing here, what's happening. A great disappointment for mm. all musicians in the world and a great yes for all dog lovers mm. in the world is that 
my dog at home can hear absolute pitch, but to all musicians, musical pitch doesn't make anything. Yeah, if you ask somebody what is a very special musical skill in listening, most people have the term ready and they say, oh, it's absolute pitch or perfect pitch. And that's and perfect pitch is, is when you, you hear a tone and you can say, I don't have absolute pitch ready. At least I can't label it, but people with absolute pitch say, and they say, oh, that's an F sharp or, or a G. If you remove that labeling, for instance, just like you have to remember the, 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 the first note of a melody, then that seems to be a very widespread skill. So young children, for instance, the tunes that they know from their favorite TV program, if you present them that tune from that TV program and the tune slightly scaled up or scaled down, and everything else the same, they are able to distinguish which one was the original. Uh, the same with tunes that we know very well. So if we take, imagine a tune or a, a piece of music that we know very well, that we've listened to often, and then sing it to ourselves or aloud, then it turns out that you sing it exactly at the right pitch, in exactly the right tempo most of the time. And so it turns out that we actually, also in the development of, of human beings that we actually start with absolute pitch. That's the first thing we have. We, we recognize or we code or we remember uh, pitches in, their, in an absolute sense, like this dead high. And later on the relative pitch takes over. We start listening more relatively in terms of relations later on and we start with listening to pitches in a very absolute way. Relative pitch means we can recognize melodies or we can... Yeah, the word relative uh, refers to that, that we listen in terms of relations. So in relative pitch you sort of focus more on the contour of the melody and the relations between the tones. So if a melody is higher or lower, it sounds like the same melody, but just higher or lower, or slower or faster. We, so we listen to the relationships and that's the identity of the song. That's, we recognize the song, whether it is high or low, as being, oh, that's that song. And in absolute pitch, you listen for the, the pitches themselves, actually the frequencies, the fundamental frequencies. And that's if it's slightly higher, it's it's different. So, and it turns out that, for instance, for birds, that if they listen to a melody and you transpose that melody slightly up, to them it's another melody, it's another bird. So that so they have absolute pitch in the in the real sense. But for us, that's often we don't even notice that anymore. We focus far more on the relationships like what is similar over the transformations and not so much to the frequencies themselves. So, but what is it, what the bird hears? Does he hear a different message in the song? The main function of song in birds is, is two things. One is to show your territory and the other one is to attract mates. Those are the main functions of, of, of song. What they are listening for is changing in the literature. We thought always that they had absolute pitch in the sense I just explained, so that they would focus on the on the pitches, frequencies, and that is sort of linked to identity, like that particular song is that bird and I should stay away, or uh, that, that, that those pitches are assigned to that bird and that's very attractive, <laughs> I should meet that person. <laughs> and, uh, but more recently, I think, it's now two or three years ago, it turns out that if you do the proper experiment, and that's what behavioral biologists have teached me, that if you uh, do the proper experiment, it turns out that they focus not so much on the pitches or on the frequencies, but far more on the sound quality, on the way the sound changes, on the way the spectrum changes all the time, and not so much on the pitches themselves. So they listen more to, uh, to sound or to music in the way we listen to speech. If we listen to speech, we hear things changing all the time, vowels, uh, sort of, we focus on, on, on the sounds not so much on the pitches. Uh, and if you listen to, uh, to music, we focus more on the pitches, so not so much on the sounds. And that's, that's I think, a big uh, a difference between the, the listening, the musical listening of birds, focusing more on the sound quality, and our musical listening, at least in our Western culture, because we, we don't know how uh, widespread that is, <laughs> uh, uh, focusing more on the pitches and the rhythms. Dopamine is the key word in uh, this. Humans send dopamine to their brains. Mm -hmm. When they listen to music, do birds do that? I mean, do birds enjoy when they're singing? Yeah, birds, I think that uh, there is some evidence that shows that they enjoy it. With regard to dopamine, I'm not too sure. But there's, there's some studies, for instance, by Gregory Ball, that show that uh, if a male bird 
sinks, it also uh, generates more testosterone, so uh, hormone uh, production, and uh, so in a way gets excited or gets pleasure out of out of singing, <coughs> and that actually this has a function that this hormone production affects the gene expression and, exp and, and has an influence on the development of the song uh, uh, structures in the in the in the bird brain. So that's an interesting. I call it gene environment interaction. So the the, the singing singing changes their brains. So that's a fascinating idea to, to think about because it gives and it gives pleasure because apparently the biology thinks it is important. The same with the dopamine eh? in, in human listening. If you you look forward to this particular chord change or you look forward to this particular melody, and in anticipation. 10 seconds before that moment happens, if you do that with music you really love, you see this dopamine uh, generation. And the dopamine is, is, yeah, is evidence that the reward system is involved in listening, uh, which is such an abstract thing as music, which is very peculiar, I would say. It is normally, yeah, the reward system is active uh, uh, with, with, with activities that are fundamentally biologically important, like eating and, uh, and having sex. But also with uh, uh, such an abstract thing like uh, like music, and that is very informative. That means that music taps into this very uh, old basal ganglia uh, coordinated um, uh, behavior, uh, and suggests that music must have some biological basis, in my opinion. So that's again one one piece of evidence that shows that the pleasure, that the pleasure, getting pleasure out of listening. Uh, um, is a very nice index of this long evolutionary history that Darwin already suggests that uh, musicality has. Underlining what Darwin said and at the same time adding hypothesis to it, what would you say that research you are, or that research network you are building uh, is leading to? I think that now what this book, but also there is also a scientific uh, like research agenda published at uh, MIT Press uh, last year uh, with lots of colleagues, 23 colleagues. Um, we we yeah we have a research agenda, <laughs> so we know now uh, that the capacity for music is or what I call musicality has uh, uh, both cultural and biological aspects. That we share that with more animals, and now the the ambition is to make that more precise and, uh, and, and, and try to understand the mechanisms. And uh, yeah, the good thing is that more and more biologists, psychologists, uh, and more recently even people from genetics are really interested in in trying to understand what this capacity for music is. The same thing happened with language, yeah, like uh, 40 years maybe ago, or in the Chomsky revolution, that there was a, <coughs> an enormous pool of scientists and energy of sort of trying to understand language, its structure, but also its biology and even evolution. And that uh, lots of people were involved and you saw an enormous progress in that field. And I hope now that the same thing will happen with uh, music. Now it is more clearly not only a cultural phenomenon or a luxury even, if, as some people call it, but a very old and maybe even preceding language. Uh, 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 mechanism that we share with lots of other animals. So will we be able to listen more closely to music? Will we listen more colorful to music? Will we um, understand the musical language of animals? Ooh, uh, I don't, if you know more about a particular phenomenon, it, it will interfere, of course, with, with your perception, if not only in the terms of that you have a more rich understanding or appreciation of the phenomenon itself. Uh, when I listen now to, the, to music, I sometimes do that music of all over the world, then it is fascinating to see all this variety. It is also very fascinating to see that if, if you look for the basic mechanisms, that that's also in all these music. So there's lots of things are shared also between all these different musics. And that to appreciate that is, is a result of the knowledge that we start to get about the phenomenon of musicality.